ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Buck. And thank you for being here, Buck, and we appreciate you a lot. Well, I see a lot of friends here tonight, and a lot of clients, and I see some new people that I don't know. Nice to have you all. Thanks for being here. Closer? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, when this whole project started, um, the club asked me to, to do one of these Tuesday night uh, shows, and I decided to talk about... Is it close enough now? <laughs> okay. I decided to talk about how the uh, M.O. Cowboy came to be. And Donna and I, when we started putting the PowerPoint together, we asked the question, when did that idea really start? And the further we traced it back, we decided it probably started with my childhood because had I not been raised on a ranch, um, I would have never done it. So I'm not going to give you uh, much more biography he did enough, but I'm going to show you some early pictures from the ranch, give you an idea of what things were like. And, uh, and I have to tell you, before I show you the pictures, that in all those, those days, all we had was a little box camera that had a little tiny lens in it. And you had to, you had to hold it down like this, and you had to hold it really still because when you pushed the shutter, it, would, it was a very stiff shutter, and it would move, and that would blur all the pictures. And then you would you'd take it down to the store, and you'd leave it at the store, and it took them two or three weeks to get it developed. And then it was maybe two or three weeks till you got to the store, so a month or a month and a half later, you finally got your roll of film. 24 little black and white pictures, and 50% of them were no good. The heads were cut off, the feet were cut off, somebody looked dumb, you know. So you just, you don't have very many in the very beginning, and then time and the elements take care of the rest of them, so it's pretty pathetic. But anyway, let's go. Oh, that's the end. Oh, oh, wrong way. All right, so I've already talked about that. So here's a picture of me when I'm about uh, 12 years old. This is my pet bull, Toro. Uh, they moved a bunch of mother cows and this calf was left behind. It's a leppy calf, hadn't had anything to drink, was seriously dehydrated. I took him home and raised him. And he was stunted. You can see by the size of his horns. He's, he's six or seven years old there. And he was just this yard pet. He hung around the milk brows and the and the uh, horse pasture, and, and he was too small to mount a cow, so we didn't worry about that. <laughs> this is another picture of me raising a leppy calf. Here's a picture of the family sitting in the ranch house. It's me and my mother <clears throat> and my dad and my two sisters. And you see there beside my, behind my mother's head is a stove pipe. We were still cooking on wood at that time. Although by the time this picture was taken, we also had a gas stove for summertime when it was hot. Here's a picture of my mother in the 1950s on her horse Susie, a roundup. Uh, we would round up on the desert like the 15th of March and move the cattle to the mountains. Do you recognize that photograph? Yeah. Yeah. Here's a picture of my dad. Notice the horse's head is blurred, <laughs> which means it's probably the best photograph out of that batch. <laughs> uh, here's a picture of my dad on a bareback bronc. Uh, it's the only picture I have, and unfortunately, neither him nor the horse is in perfect form, but uh, yeah, he was a good bronc rider. He was a bull rider, too. Bareback. Here's a picture of my great granddad, R.L. McCain. And I always thought with this photograph, even if you if if you didn't know him, he looks like a rancher, doesn't he? And you would know that he's you'd know that he's not just a cowboy; he's a rancher. He's the boss. I, I threw this picture in because <clears throat> this is Tuli Jim McCain and Dick McCain, and Dick is Tuli's grandson. So you can see here how the dress has changed in that one generation. <laughs> Julie's wearing that black hat and that black neckerchief and leather cuffs, and Dick is no neckerchief, no cuffs, and a short sleeve shirt. I think that's kind of an interesting photo. Here's a picture of me, I'm in my 20s, still doing a little bit of cowboying, although I was a full-time artist 
but I don't know, I guess it was still in my system. <laughs> 1976, I'm living in Santa Fe, I have my studio there, I'm an artist full time. So I'm in my studio one day and Ernie Burke comes by. Ernie Burke was a well-known sculptor and painter, showed at Kennedy Galleries in New York, showed the big time galleries in Santa Fe. And so he was sitting there watching me paint and he said to me, he said, have you ever uh, tried sculpting? I said, no. He said, well, you're trying to paint around corners. <laughs> I said, yeah, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, it means that you're trying to do things with paint that you should be doing with wax. Now, I never have figured out what paint around corners is. But anyway, Ernie, Ernie gave me some tools and uh, some wax and got me started sculpting. He was really the guy that got me going. So these are my first, I think the, the one there on the left is about maybe that high. That was my third bronze, I think. And then Ernie took me through the foundry process so that uh, I would know every step of the production. Because wax and clay will do many things that bronze will not do. So a sculptor has to know, you have to know what your medium will do and what it will not do. You have to, you have to in a sense, work for bronze. That was an important step. Later on, I got to bigger stuff. In the lower left-hand corner there is St. Francis, uh, which is, I think, five years old. In the middle there is the Soldado de Cuera, which is down here in the Presidio. And that uh, one on the higher right there <clears throat> is the bronze at the entryway to Old Town. Albuquerque. Albuquerque, yeah. Here's a picture of the invocation. This is one of my favorite pieces. This is about 15 feet high. It's out in front of the Leaning Tree Museum in Boulder, or it was. It's the, Leaning, it's, the museum is now closed. But I really love doing this piece. And this is the biggest piece I ever did. It's called Spirit. Uh, these horses, well, I think you can tell by me standing there how big they are. They're, they're, they're mammoth, they're huge. The, the horse that's rearing up there in the back is about 15 feet in the air. And the bronze is currently uh, in ASU? Yeah, ASU in uh, Tempe. Wrong place. Is wrong, place. wrong place? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Really? <laughs> this is uh, Winfield Scott, the founder of Scottsdale. Uh, I actually did this piece in Tucson in our studio across the street from the MO Club. So here's a picture of the studio we had on Tool Avenue right across the street from the MO Club. On the upper left there, I don't know if you can see it or not, but Jessica, my daughter, and I are on ladders working on the Rex Allen Monument. And in the lower right here, you see this horse with his leg lifted up. That's the horse from the Valdez Cuera, uh, uh, the, 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 the sculpture in Albuquerque. Wow. So you can see how tall the ceilings we had. It was, a, it was a great space. We had about 3,000 square feet of a top deck, and we had 3,000 square feet of storage. So it was, a, it was a wonderful studio. Here's a picture of my daughter modeling uh, Rex Allen's face. <laughs> There's another picture of she and I working on Rex Allen, and these two horse heads are off the, uh, the large uh, Spanish soldier piece. The one on the lower <coughs> left, when we found this photograph, I thought to myself, why didn't I cast that in a bronze? I think it would make kind of a neat bronze to put on a, a, a pedestal or a pillar. I don't know why I didn't have that idea. <laughs> Typical day at the old oh. club about four o'clock. Uh, I, uh, I was a member of the MO Club, I think in 1978, but that was a, a, an artist member. And I had never really used the facilities of the club. So one day I walked across the street for lunch and uh, I met all these guys. They introduced me, you were there, uh, introduced me to everybody in the bar and I felt like 
yeah, this is this is where I belong. You know how when you meet a bunch of people that are just right and it clicks? I thought, yeah, this is my place. So uh, many of these guys, well, all of them were, became very good friends of mine. This is, <laughs> this is my number one female model fooling around in the studio. I don't know who took the picture. Uh, I don't know if I took it or Jessica took it, but I, I think it's kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I was at that time in my life, I decided I wanted to do something different. I was tired of doing big bronzes. I wanted to do something just, you know, off to the side. So I got this idea that I would do a sculpture in like fiberglass, and then I could polychrome it, which means paint it. And I would do it in incredible detail, and I wanted it to come in about one-third the price of bronze. And you think about, uh, it's real easy when you get to a life-size piece to have a thirty to $50,000 bronze. So if you, could make some, if you could make something this big, rather than be 30000 if you could make it for 10000 I thought, wow, I would have a good market base there. So um, I was thinking about that, and Bill Harmson stopped by the studio. Now, Bill Harmson was a member of the club, and he was an important art collector. I was casting uh, a lot of his pieces and my pieces in fine silver for him at the time. And we were talking. Anyway, he, he happened to mention that he had all of Peshlakai's tools. Now, Peshlakai was a famous Navajo silversmith. He was the man who first had the idea of making Navajo jewelry to sell to the public rather than to wear it. In the early days, the Navajos wore their, wore their wealth. That's why you see those enormous concho belts and all the bracelets and stuff, because they were wearing their wealth. But he comes up with the idea to sell it to the white man. Now, there were probably others too, but he's the, he's the granddaddy of them all. Well, Bill Harmson has all his tools. I think, now nah, that's, that's cool, that's cool, and I've got access to them. So I decided to do a Navajo silversmith, and I sculpt the figure you see there, and then we made molds of all these tools, and we cast them in fiberglass and painted them. So I mean, they really looked real. The only thing that's actually real there is the concho that he's holding in his hand and the concho belt that he's wearing. That's real silver and real turquoise. In fact, this thing looked, it, well, it did very well, it shows. It was, it was real popular with the public. Uh, I remember one time we had it at a show and a lady just could not believe that these tools were cast. And I said, yeah, they're, they're not real. So she reached down on the anvil and grabbed this hammer handle and jerked it up and she broke the handle. <laughs> and and so, so after that, I cast some hammers and some of the tools that I could hand to people so they could realize that they weren't real. Right? It, was, it, was, it was a project was a lot of fun. Well, the galleries hated it. Uh, they hated it because it was outside of tradition. It wasn't bronze, it wasn't wood, it wasn't marble. It was cast in fiberglass, so it was cheap plastic. It also had, uh, you, you couldn't put it out in the weather. You couldn't put it out in the full sun. You could put it outside under a ramada or something like that. So they didn't like the idea. Uh, we sold a couple of them anyway, but I was so discouraged, I, just, I scrapped the project. So I'm to hell with it. Do something different. Well, <clears throat> I had done this bronze I call Long Day Short Pay a number of years ago with a cowboy holding a saddle. And I thought, you know, that's a really cool idea. Why don't I take that idea and do it life-size, and I'll do it just like I did the silversmith. I'll do the body. You know, I'll sculpt the body, very realistic, and then I'll take a real saddle and I'll make a mold from it. I'll have all this authentic detail. Well, and I'll do it not, 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 not like an old west cowboy, not like something out of the 1880s, but the cowboys the way I remember them when I was a kid. So, I go back to my roots. You've seen these two pictures on the left. The picture on the right is my Uncle Pete Clark, who was a cowboy. And I, and I don't know what the story in this picture is, but he, 
his hair's nicely combed and he's smiling. This must have been for a sweetheart or a girlfriend or something. I don't know. But I decide that, that I'm going to do a life-size cowboy, and I'm going to do it with the 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 kind of the kind of gear cowboys had when I was a kid. And that was a real profession, believe it or not. These guys went from ranch to ranch. They worked, uh, you know, branding, breaking horses, <clears throat> building fence, whatever the job was. And they usually had some old gear that they had inherited from their folks and some new gear. So it was a crazy mixture. And that's what I decided I wanted to do, that mixture. Right, I've already, I've already covered that. By the way, you know, if you have any questions as I go along, just stop me and ask the question. If I lose you. All right. So I decided not to cast it in fiberglass. I'm going to go to urethane. Now urethane is a, uh, is a liquid. You mix two liquids together and it's exothermic. It gives off heat and it solidifies in about five to eight minutes and it captures incredible detail. So it was easier, faster, and better than fiberglass. So, I start. I had a model from the MO Club, who was a bartender, to model nude for me for the figure, because I always begin with the figure. You have to, you have to know where this elbow is, and where this wrist is, and how wide this is. You have to have the right proportions before you put clothes on, where it will look right. So we had this guy, posing nude, holding a saddle. Uh, and, and we actually had some pictures of that, but we couldn't find them. <laughs> that would have been fun. But, but then I probably shouldn't have showed him anyway because he wasn't a professional model. But anyway, so we did this uh, nude figure, and then I did the clothing. And um, <clears throat> when, when we unveil this in a little while, I'll talk more about the clothing. <clears throat> We made molds of real gear. We got a, like we made a mold of a Fred Mueller saddle from the 1930s. We made molds of real spurs and spade bit. And we cast the cowboy here in Tucson. There was a company called Santa Rita here that was doing a lot of work for the uh, Desert Museum and uh, doing a lot of work in Las Vegas, building, oh, I don't know, Egyptian temples. And, uh, Museum, museum interiors. They were casting all kinds of faux rocks and trees, all kinds of all kinds of neat stuff. So I went down to them and I talked to them about this project. They said, "Yeah, we can do that." So we, <clears throat> when the cowboy was finished, we designed a mold that could be taken apart and put on a three-axis casting machine. I, I, that's probably. Probably not something any of you have ever seen, but what it is is, well, let's take my hand. Let's say we have a mold in my hand. We put it on this machine, we pour the liquid into it, put it on the machine, and it spins my hand this way as it's spinning my hand this way. Now, I can only see two axes there, but they call it a three-axis machine. But anyway, what it does, the centrifugal force forces the liquid to the side of the mold all the way around on the inside. It sets in five to eight minutes so that when you take the mold out, you pull my hand out, it's hollow, and you have this incredible registration on the outside. It's really, really neat material. So, we cast the cowboy, we had beautiful castings, we put them all together, and then this. I find out, I find out that paint doesn't stick to your thing. Uh, uh, just, it hurts still, it still hurts. So, um, <clears throat> what do you do, you know? We, we didn't have the internet then. Doing research was really difficult to do. You go down to the library, you, you talk to people, you read per uh, periodicals, nothing. So I had borrowed a lot of money to do the silversmith. I'd only sold a couple of them. I still had a lot of debt. I had borrowed all the money I could possibly borrow to do this cowboy. I'm like this in debt. And I've got this urethane cowboy that I can't paint, right? So 
couple of days later, <coughs> I'm riding in somebody's car. Excuse me. It's a brand new Ford. <clears throat> and I noticed that the dashboard is cast in urethane. <laughs> I, can, I can tell by just clicking my finger. The water, right? I mean, it looks like barrel wood, and it looks like chrome, and I go, ah, look at this. How do these guys do this, right? So I think, you know, could I call Ford Motor Company? Would they talk to me? <laughs> yeah. Probably not, you know. But I thought, what the hell? You know, what have I got to lose? So I call Ford Motor Company. <laughs> and this very nice secretary sends me to somebody, and they send me to somebody. I wind up down in the bowels of the company talking to this guy who's the guru of urethane. <laughs> and he says, oh, yeah, you've got a problem, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. He said, well, the one you've cast, there's nothing you can do about it. That's just scrap. But I can't tell you how we do it because it's proprietary. But I can tell you how to fix your problem. He said, there's this spray that you spray on the inside of the mold. It looked like gray paint, just plain old gray. You put the mold together. You pour the urethane in. You put it on the three-axis machine. <clears throat> when you pull it out, it has this gray coating on the outside. And that coating, <coughs> pardon me, that coating is a molecular bond. So it's good, it's tough. <coughs> and you can paint it. So, the yeah. motor company bails me out. <laughs> can you believe that? I don't think that would happen in today's world. <laughs> I just don't think it could happen. No. Anyway, <coughs> this is what the cowboy looked like. And I think it's probably time, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. It's time to undo it. All right. So, Mom, Glenna, you want to do it? Ready? Yep. Ready? Yep. <laughs> This is urethane, and it's painted <clears throat> just like you paint an oil painting. And after, am I going to lose my voice in the middle of this? I hope not. Um, when I've finished here, you can come up and look at it closer. And I just painted this saddle, and I painted everything just like you paint an oil painting. Sometimes with many layers. Sometimes with very thin paint, sometimes with very thick paint. I'm going to turn it around so you can see the back side. Tell you a story. When we started casting this in bronze, we had one in Santa Fe out in front of the gallery on the sidewalk. And this place right here on his butt started losing the patina. We go out and wax it, you know, and we finally realized you could, you could see out the gallery to the, uh, the sidewalk and women. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So anyway, we, we sold a couple of them. And uh, they, they, uh, I had some small shows at one first place. And people really liked it. But um, the galleries didn't. <laughs> For the same reasons they didn't like the silversmith. And, you know, and I want to just sidetrack here for a minute. I said, look, what is an oil painting? It's some oil smeared on a canvas, right? Mm -hmm. What makes a uh, Rembrandt worth millions and millions and millions of dollars? It's not the oil, it's not the canvas, it's the fact that he did it. Yes. Or, or Michelangelo, think about, think about the, his uh, David. I mean, it's, it's just a hunk of marble, right? Yes. But it's priceless. If Michelangelo would have had something like this, he'd have used it. <laughs> and he would have done a hundred times the amount of work he did. But talking to a gallery, I hope there's no, is there any gallery owners here? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's my, they do, they do an important thing, they sell artists' work. But, but there's, um, oh, that's enough said, but I'm digging <laughs> Okay, I don't think you're, you can read any of that up there. So I'm going to just tell you what some of this paraphernalia on it is. We'll just start with the, with the floor. <coughs> you won't be able to see it in the back, but you can come up afterwards. It's, um, we've got these old boards from a plank floor. It says on the brochure it's from a saddle shed, but it isn't really. <laughs> this is a Fred Mueller saddle. This is from Denver, about 1935, something like that. And it's halfway between the early ape work saddles with the dally horns and the new roping saddles that people are riding now. So you still have the dally horn wrapped in rawhide, which is so typical of the cowboys in California. And you've got some swells here, which is nice if you're riding Bronx or you're in a rough country. It's nice to have something there to brace your thigh against. And a high kennel. But it has round skirts. It's lighter in weight. And uh, this one has, as you'll see, what we call bullnose tapaderas on it because for the, for the brush, a lot of brush in that country. Guys wearing bat wing, bat wing shafts, they call them three snaps, they got three snaps on the back, which was real typical in California. But the early cowboys wore shotgun shafts. They were like, like a pair of pants. It was sewn all the way around. Mexicans wore these these kind of shafts. In fact, yes, Hank is smiling at me there. Hank's got one of my set of shafts. Um, the, bride, the bit on here belonged to my great granddad. It's a Spanish spade bit, not Spanish Mexican. Uh, probably made 1880s, 1890s, something like that. And it's been passed down through the family. My mother gave it to me, and now I have it, and I used it in this. The cuffs, the early cowboys all wore them, and nobody really seems to know why. There's, there's lots of stories. They were good for fencing, they were for rope burns, they were for this, for that. Who knows what they were really for? I thought they were great for building fence because we didn't have good, we never had good gloves. So it was nice to have that protection right there. But other than that, I never could see any reason for them. All the old cowboys wore neckerchiefs. Um, again, that's one of those things, why? I, I, I don't know why. When it's cold, uh, you can have a coat on, you got this V open right here, the cold air is going down, the neckerchief's a nice thing to have. And it's nice in the sandstorm, but other than that, I don't know, but they all wore them. And then I put a modern hat on, a modern block hat. So, the, how we did this is we actually made molds of some of this real stuff, like the saddle and the belt buckle. This is an old Justin Boot, um, Justin Boot Company buckle. So the buckle and the bit and the saddle and the planks, those are all made, those are molds made from real things. And then cast in fiberglass and then attached to this clay body. But there were lots of places where we couldn't mold a real thing, or where we had a scene where I had to sculpt it in, that, had to sculpt that scene in. In fact, this piece here, I actually sculpted, because we couldn't figure out how to, 
how to make a mold of that. I got really good at faking things. We made, made tools. Uh, we made tools to match these old uh, half-worn stampings. It was really well, wild. It was a lot of fun. But the shirt, for instance, I sculpted this. Now, you, you may think it looks realer than it really is, but I'm tricking you. First of all, it has less wrinkles, and they're bigger and more exaggerated. But here in the front, I cut this strip off of a real shirt. And I dipped it in wax and glued it on. <laughs> so your eye, your eye looks at that and sees that incredible detail, and you just assume this is as detailed as that is. It's a trick painters. All the painters in here know what I'm talking about. You give somebody you what I'm talking about. You give somebody a couple of really strong details, and then you can kind of fade it off to the sides. So I'm doing the same thing here. And the same thing on the shafts. They're impossibly rough. Nobody could ever have a set of shafts like this. But I've got some very realistic looking stuff here. And this is very realistic looking. So the contrast, your eye just fills it in. So afterwards, come up and look at it and you'll see what I mean. So there's, I'm telling you, there's a lot of trickery in it. It's not as real as you think it is. Anyway, uh, where am I? Um, I forgot where I am. Oh, the galleries don't like it. I think we already covered that. So, I'm across the street having lunch at the MO Club one day, sitting with Joe Meyerhauser. And Joe asked me how the, how the project's going. I'm, I'm pretty disappointed, pretty bummed out about it. And Joe says, uh, well, uh, what would it cost to do it in bronze? And I had been kind of thinking about that, so I had a price. I gave him a price, and he said, yeah, I like that, cast me one. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, we took the mold to Shidoni in Santa Fe, and we cast him one in bronze. And there you see a picture of Joe on one side and me on the other side. That's the bronze. It's not a colossal cave. And that's a picture of Melody and I, I think the dedication day there beside the cowboy. Okay, so I'm across the street having lunch at the MO Club again. And I was, I was late getting there that day. The place was really packed. And there was only one chair available, and it was with Rukin and uh, Carrie Jilks. So I'm sitting with them, and they're asking me how Joe's <coughs> Cowboy's doing, and we're talking about it. And Carrie says to me, <clears throat> Why don't we have one of those? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> we could work on that. And she, and she said, you know, I think we should have one. And she stood up in the middle of the bar and she said, I think the MO Club ought to buy one of Buck's Cowboys. And there was like just this kind of silence that ran through the crowd. And then everyone went, yeah. And, and Carrie wrote the first check for $1,000. And I think, right, yeah, you wrote the second check. You were right in there, you were in the beginning there someplace. Anyway, um, within uh, within five minutes or so, we had $10,000 in, in checks and pledges. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there you can see a typical day in the bar. This is, this is, this is four o'clock. <laughs> yeah. So for everybody who gave us a thousand dollars, I made a little keychain of uh, an ounce of sterling silver. So the deal was, you give me a thousand dollars, I give you a keychain. <laughs> ah, panic again. So Doc Sanders had come to me and said, let's do an auction to raise the additional money we needed. We needed about $30,000. We had about ten, so we needed an additional $20,000. So he said, let's do an auction. We'll get all the ranchers to give us some old stuff, and we'll get the members to give us stuff. And of course, all you artists uh, paint a picture. So I paid a picture for the auction to buy my own bronze. <laughs> Yes, typical emo, typical emo deal. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so we gathered all this stuff up, and um, 
The night of the auction comes, of course, I'm scared, scared to death. The place was packed. Uh, people were happy. There was a lot of energy in the air, a lot of drinking, which is always a good sign. And the auction started kind of slow. Two or three things were up on the auction block. And then Floyd Robb's Sweet Onions. Some of you knew Floyd, I'm sure. Um, came up on the auction. So, and I'm not just, I'm talking about a bag of onions like this, right? So, the bidding started $25, $50, $75, $100, $150, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250, $250,
I think these are backwards. Anyway, that's me standing on the base. I don't know why. I have no idea why I'm standing there. Here's a picture of our very old Henry dancing a jig with Bob Miller. Is Henry here tonight by any chance? Oh, that's too bad. And that's Doc Sanders at the podium. Here's Doc making the speech. That's our board members and the people who are directly involved in it. And the red, of course, is, is uh, the cowboy draped. Here's Jack Goodman and somebody else pulling the uh, fabric off. And here's the party. <laughs> Okay, so when we moved from the old club to the new club, uh, Floyd Robs and I, or uh, Horst Metz and I came out and designed that circular uh, thing you see there. But it was a, it had been a fountain at one time. We tore the fountain out and we put that faux rock in there and we put it at that elevation so that if you were driving down the road to the club, that archway would he would be standing in that archway. And the rock was originally designed to be a fountain, but we decided that um, that was probably too much maintenance and too much money and too much trouble, so we shut the fountain off. We put dirt around the edge of it to, to plant flowers, <laughs> our intention being that it would be, you know, something like this. I love this. COVID. <laughs> That's, that's a great photograph. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I really like that. So here's two pictures uh, of what the cowboy was originally intended to look like and what it looks like now. And I hope you will agree with me that those those cactus need to be cut out of there. Uh, Luis Serpa donated the largest cactus there. And I tell you, I knew Luis for 30, 40 years. And the thing that made her photography so wonderful one of the things that made it so wonderful is she understood composition. Mm -hmm. I think if Louise was here tonight, she'd say, cut the damn thing down. <laughs> uh, it probably almost works, too. And uh, I just had a birthday, so that's... Oh. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's, I need a microphone, yeah. That's the end of my speech. I have, I have a few little drawings up here for sale and bronze. And this is for sale. The couple that, the, the couple that had this, they had a large, a very large home, and they downsized it. They don't have any place for it. So if anybody's interested, um, let's talk about it. So have we got any questions? What's his name? <laughs> we just called him the cowboy. It's not very up on the air. Yeah. <laughs> you can name him Jeannie when you call him. Yeah. And, and I'm, yeah, I want to introduce my mother. Will you stand up, Mom? Yeah. <laughs> When my, uh, my great granddad, when he died, uh, he gave it to my mother. We're talking about this bit. And she rode with it for many, many years. It's a spade bit. And now I have it. That's great. That's great. Hanging on the wall. That's great. Bravo. Bravo. Any other questions? Buck, you, you've got a lot of mediums you can work in. How do you go about deciding how to apply your talents to? whatever image or thing that you're going to try to do. You know, I, I get bored. Uh, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be sculpting for a year, and I just get tired of, of, of all. Sculpting is, it's really fun doing all this clay work and this creative work, but then you have to go through a foundry. And it's a lot of, lot of brutal, uh, hard, dirty work. So after about a year or two of that, I usually want to get to my paintbrushes, something clean and delicate and quiet, and, you know, and it's not hazardous. Uh, so, and then I, I get tired of painting and then want to pick up the wax again. So I just kind of bounce back and forth like that. Um, no rhyme or reason to it, really. So what's the difference with 
coloring, the coloring on this and our our cow that we used to rub, it, rub his buns out in the park at the ammo club. And now I have, I have a little guy, so I can rub his buns every night. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, the color of this cowboy is different than the one we have outside. And the other thing is, is that I had always asked Bach if he could make some smaller ones. And so we were on a bus someplace, going, oh, we went down to Floyd Rob's ugly place. And, he's, and, and Ray said, he's going to make some small cowboys. And I said, I'll take one. I'll take one, I don't care. Dave said, how much is it going to cost? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to have one. But, and so, I had, because you said, at the MO club, when you came out, you always rubbed your bobs and bobs and said, good night. So I now I have, I have now one at home. But anyway, so I had rubbed his bobs, but I asked my husband if I could put him in the bedroom, and he said no. <laughs> Elaborate on that. <laughs> well, I have one more question. Yeah. The uh, the patina on the cowboy out front does not look as rich as the pictures from no, 25 it, years it's, ago. It's because it's because the patina is really a living thing. Yeah. It, it's subjected to all the pollution in the air, and it will continue to change until some point when it, when it reaches a chemical stability with whatever's in the air. There's really no way of keeping the patina from, that kind of patina from changing. It's just one of the, one of the things that happens. And you asked uh, Mary about the difference in the color. This is oil paints. This is oil paints on urethane. The real cowboy is patina on bronze. So one's chemical, one's oil paints. So um, any other questions? But yes. What, what foundries are open still? Any? The question was, what foundries are open? Well, um, you know, we've lost a lot of foundries the last few years. We still have one here in Tucson. Oh. No, it's a good foundry. It's small, but it's a good foundry. A lot of them have closed down. Uh, Shadoni closed down where, where I cast in Santa Fe. It was a fabulous foundry. We could, we could cast 700 pounds of metal at a time. So we could do big jobs. Yeah. They closed down, and the only place that I can find in, the, in America to cast 700 pounds of metal at a time now is in Oklahoma. Oh, there's a couple of foundries uh, in Denver. Uh, there's there's one up in Montana, I think, and one in Texas, or two in Texas. We're we're real low on foundries. Somebody could it'd be a good time to open a foundry. <laughs> yeah, not, not me. Yeah. Anybody else? Hey, Bob. Yeah. Linda over here. Uh, your invocation, just so you know, is uh, was hand chosen by Tom James to be the entrance to the uh, Raymond headquarters. Yeah, yeah. It's on the hillside, yeah. and it's you have to go buy it to go in, and go buy it to go out. Thank you. Yeah, she said that uh, I have um, uh, one of the invocation bronzes. That's the Indians on the horse pulling up the buffalo skull. It's at Raymond James in uh, Florida at the headquarters. And it's outside. It's it's a really beautiful installation. That was a great job working for those people. Nice people. We bought some of my paintings too. It's great job. Any other questions? Buck. Yeah. That painting is yours. That painting is yours. The Santa Fe Mission. Yeah. Oh yeah. This this is mine too. Um, I, uh, I put that in. I put that in the art one of the art shows and. Um, I think it was Jack Goodman. Uh, came up to me and he said, "I think the club ought to have that." And he said, "Can, can you give the club a good?" good price? <laughs> and I did, and they bought it. That's the story on that. Any other questions? Yeah, there's another question. That's for sale. Oh yeah, this is for sale. This is for sale too. I did this, this was a small edition, it's an Apache Warrior. 
It's the last one in the edition. This is this is the end of it. So, but we will we will uh, do a normal sort of random number generator um, on people who put their names down for the paintings. Yeah. If, if there's more than one. If there's more than one. Okay. Okay. Anything else? We got it. We've got a special token for you, but for, for thanking you for a wonderful, wonderful evening. And we're going to now, after we sort of say we're done with the lecture, we're going to let people that are interested come up, and, as they've done before, as we've done in a couple of other of these sessions, come up and begin to look at these and sign up for them. And then what kind of time frame you want to put on the 10 minutes? So 10 minutes uh, starting now. <laughs>